So we are in uh, Galatians chapter 4. And tonight uh, we're starting a new section. And I decided to dash through the whole section, which is, you know, astonishing for me. Nine verses, I think it is. Uh, uh, rather than build verse by verse through this. And uh, th this section, the way it's laid out, it seems to me that to really understand it, we need to en encompass the whole section as a whole rather than just take it piecemeal and then keep reviewing and adding a little bit each week. So um, that's what I decided to do. I sort of weighed this back and forth. There's something in the first verse we'll look at that I want to come back to, uh, and uh, maybe we'll do that next week. Uh, but, uh, but to get the whole of what is being said here, I think it's important to just get this whole section in one big chunk. So we're going to have to get moving here. Now what we're doing then is we're covering one more step in Constable's outline. I have uh, sent out the, uh, the uh, PDF with the notes. If you want to follow along in the notes, I don't know if you find that helpful. And uh, they're certainly something, if you wish, to keep. I think we're going verse by verse through. We're getting a good idea of what's uh, in this passage, and I think that's helpful. Now, this section, Constable calls the historical illustration. He's working on the doctrine of salvation by faith, essentially salvation by faith alone, plus nothing, minus nothing. And uh, so the first, chapter 3 was the vindication of the doctrine. Chapter 4 is a clarification of the doctrine. And he says there's three illustrations that Paul is using in chapter 4 to, to sort of fill out our understanding of what Paul is saying when he comes to salvation by faith. Now, I'm not sure, personally, whether historical illustration is really the best term for this section. I think perhaps personal illustration might work better because Paul is talking about his own experience with the Galatians. He's reminding them of uh, his, their interaction in the past. It is history, of course, in the sense that it happened in the past, but it's personal. And so I think that perhaps would be a better term. But I am just giving you Constable's outline, so that's why we have that point there. So since we're rushing through so many verses, let's just go ahead and read the text. I'm going to begin in verse uh, 12, and we're going to read through to verse 20. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. So there's obviously a very personal element to this section. And we're going to just work our way through. I actually have four points. And so we're just going to be touching really briefly on each of them. But first of all, the call to gospel union. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. And there is, you'll notice it, uh, if your Bible includes uh, the italics to show where the translators are suggesting some words to us, uh, you will notice uh, that there's, there are several in this verse. And... Um, the literal rendering of the text is like this. Become as I, because I also as you. Okay, Become as I, as I also as you. Because I also as you. All right. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice, as I say, the translators have supplied a few extra words. And the other thing about this verse is that last verse, you, that last phrase, you have done me no wrong, actually goes with the following verse. It doesn't really, it's not really part of the construction of verse 12. 
there's a bit of confusion about what Paul means. Obviously, it's a fairly cryptic statement. Become as I, because I also as you. What's he saying? Now, some reference, uh, some commentators will reference to other passages where Paul talks about cultural adaptation. Where he talks about how he becomes... Uh, like people in order to win them to the gospel, for example. And there is a modern word for this, and it's called contextualization. And it is there is a place for a certain kind of textualization. Or excuse me, did I say textualize? Contextualization. So there is, a, there is a place for contextualization. There is, in terms of ministry. Uh, it, there is a sense in which Christians could be creating a Christian culture within their church, or if they go to a foreign land, they're bringing in a Christian plus a whatever nationality they are culture. And so there is a sense in which you need to somewhat fit into the population in which you are ministering in order to reach them with the gospel. That's true. Uh, But that whole thought requires a separate message. And as I said, this is where I want to probably go next week. We'll talk about this idea. But that's not really what Paul is talking about. It's not the subject of Galatians. Uh, We'll talk about contextualization because this verse will suggest it, but it isn't what this verse is about. And it's not what Galatians is, is about. As you know, Galatians is about the influence of false teachers in Galatia. And these false teachers were of a Jewish background, and they were tempting the Galatians to submit to the law either as A means of salvation. In other words, you don't really know God. You don't really really know Christ unless you are circumcised, unless you keep these Jewish feast days, unless you follow the law in these various ways. Or a means of salvation. Or a means of sanctification. You will not come close to God. You'll, you know, you're sort of uh, not as, uh, you're not reaching the higher plane you should be reaching unless you do these things. So a means of sanctification. Or it could be both, actually. All right. So, uh, so the debate is law versus grace. So Paul is calling them to union with Christ by faith, and that's the whole message of the book, and that's what he's talking about in this whole section. He's, he's ju- he is teaching justification, salvation, by faith, by faith alone. And that is what he means, I think, when he says, become as I am. His rationale was, then, his reason is, All right, so let's look at our verse, verse 12. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am. So trusting in Christ alone by faith. Not trusting in Christ alone by faith plus circumcision. Not trusting in Christ alone by faith plus uh, keeping the Jewish feast days. That's not what he's talking about. That's what not becoming as I am. Become as I am, one who completely has laid aside the law and has Put his full trust in Jesus Christ by faith alone. That's what he wants you to become. Why? He says, why? Because for I also, as you, I also, our translators say, have become as you are. What does he mean by that? Well, Paul came to them not as a Jew dependent on the legal system of the law. That's not how he approached them. He was a Jew, obviously. He had a Jewish culture. But he came to them as a man exhibiting only faith in Christ, just as God had called them to do. They were outside of the law. These primarily Gentile Christians, uh, before they were Christians, were outside the law. They weren't subject to the law. They had no conscience of the law. They had no obligations to the law. And so Paul, became he came to them just as they were. He came to them outside the law. He didn't call them inside the law, but rather into Christ. And that was his message. And so he became as them. He says, you become as me because I become as you. You see what we're saying here? So in order to understand this section, we need to be clear on this opening proposition. It's really almost like a propositional statement here. Become as I am, for I also have become as you are. That is what this whole section is all about. That they would be believing in Christ by faith. I have a quote from uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary that says this, Become like me, for I became like you. That is, 
become free from the law as I am, for after my conversion I became like the Gentiles, no longer living under the law. The irony, however, was that the Galatian Gentiles were putting themselves under the law after their conversions. And so this was the whole call to, Christ, to the gospel union. He wanted them to be just like him. And everyone who comes to Christ and comes into salvation, we come in exactly the same way. We aren't putting on requirements. and We aren't putting on um, uh, you know, a, a list of things that we must perform in order to be saved. We aren't saying that we become sanctified if we'll just do this, 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 and this. We are saying, I come to Christ just as I am and without one plea as we sing in the song. We, are, we have nothing to bring. We just come and we say, Lord Jesus, save me. And that's the way we come. So the union in the gospel. That's the basic proposition here. So he talks about the hopefulness of the past. And this is where I said, verse 12, the last phrase goes with, the next couple of verses. Now, it's interesting how our translation puts this. You have done me no wrong. And the way it is written there, the way it's translated, makes it sound like the current practices of the Galatians had done Paul no wrong. In other words, they're sort of flirting around with the, uh, with the Judaizers, has not really done Paul wrong. And that doesn't seem to make sense because in this book he's saying, no, wait a minute, you guys, what are you doing? And he's quite stern with them. So I noted, uh, I was looking at the, the Greek, and I said, that doesn't sound quite right to me. It seems to me it should be translated in a different way. And I looked at some other versions, and I noticed the NIV of all the versions seems to do the best job here. It says... You did me no wrong. It makes it clear this verb is a past tense verb, and it puts it in the past. You did me no wrong. When? But you know, he says, that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. The first time he came amongst them, they did him no wrong. You see? And so in verses 14, 13 and 14, it talks about Paul, the past visit when he came to them the first time. Now it says here that there was some kind of uh, physical trial, a bodily illness, that actually led him to Galatia. When we were in Acts 13 in our Sunday morning series some months ago now, uh, we talked about the speculation that uh, Paul got sick down on the coast of Asia Minor, that he had originally been intending to go on over to Ephesus, and uh, instead, because of his illness, that he went up into the mountain country to Antioch of Pisidia and then over to Iconium and Lystra and Derby, because of this illness. He went up into the high country. Now, uh, there's, of course, a great deal of speculation about what this illness was. But there's no real conclusive proof what it was. Uh, it's interesting that um, uh, William Ramsey thought it was malaria. And uh, others have suggested other things, an eye disease. And uh, some have even suggested epilepsy. But it doesn't, it, to me, it's not clear. Why would he, <laughs> you know, it was epilepsy. Why would you go up into the mountains to escape it? It would go with you wherever you went. In any case, it was some kind of physical affliction. And it made Paul's personal appearance distasteful, uh, even loathsome. He uses that word here. Uh, you did not despise or loathe, all right? And uh, nevertheless, the Galatians received Paul as an angel or even as Christ himself. They listened to what he said and it was as if God was speaking to them right from heaven. And they received Paul's preaching as it were the word of God, which indeed, of course, it is. They gladly received his message and turned from idols to God. And they were eager and joyful about their new Christian relationship. And that was a wonderful time, that whole ministry amongst those Christians in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, all those, and, and points in between. I'm, I, no doubt I'm, uh, uh, I'm sure that, uh, that there were other little spots where Paul preached along the way, and Christians were, uh, came, sprung up, and churches were established, and so forth. So that was the hopefulness of the past. That was the thing... He said, now things were so good. Then he goes to the conflict of the present. Where then, verse 15, where then is that sense of blessing you had? 
Right? That's what you had. For, he says, I bear you witness, if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So the, their old spirit was no longer pleasant, present. The, the implication of his question is that you don't, you don't have this joy and this, this delight and this camaraderie with, me, uh, camaraderie with me and fellowship and all of this. You don't have that anymore. And he uses this expression, in the past you would have plucked out your eyes for me. Now this has led some to speculate, of course, that the problem was some kind of eye disease. Now, uh, maybe, it's possible, there's other little indications that people tie in with this and say, oh yeah, see, it proves Paul was clearly, you know, he had an eye problem. Well, we don't know that. It doesn't exactly say. And <clears throat> it might be, some commentaries have suggested, it might simply be a proverbial expression. Paul, uh, Tom Constable says, here's a quote from his commentary, plucked out your eyes is probably a figurative expression Similarly, similar to given your eye teeth. You know how someone will say, oh, I would give my eye teeth for something like that. In other words, I would make some kind of sacrifice to, uh, to get or to achieve some particular thing. Well, this, this may have been that kind of express, expression. You would have plucked out your eyes for me. That showed the devotion that they would have had towards the Apostle Paul. He says, where is that spirit? Where is that spirit? That old, old spirit is no longer pre present, and, there, and it no longer prevails. So instead of gladness, what is there? He says to them, so have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Right? Uh, now they're looking suspiciously at him, or they're beginning to. The false teachers are certainly pushing for this conclusion. They're trying to get, the, uh, get out the notion that Paul is somehow... Uh, you know, he, he's not one to be trusted. And now, uh, another comment here, this one is from Grant Osborne, he says, Paul is not saying these uh, things have gotten this far, but the situation is moving in this direction. In other words, you know, if, if this continued, they would end up viewing Paul as their enemy. By asking this rhetorical question, Paul wants them to think seriously about the repercussions of continuing on the path they have chosen. And ultimately, if they have made, they make Paul an enemy, they're making God an enemy. You start making out that salvation comes by doing some works of your own, you are put, setting yourself on a path that makes God your, your enemy. And Paul is, he's being pretty straightforward with this. He talks about the ambition of these religious leaders, verse 17. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, so the false teachers sought them in a party spirit, attempting to lock out the apostle so they could have the Galatians for themselves. They're seeking them not for Christ, but for themselves. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, commendably but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. That's a big difference between what Paul does and what they are doing. All right, he says, verse 18, it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. What does he mean by that? Well, it is good to have teachers who care about you and who are interested in you and interested in your good and want you to grow. It's good to have a pastor like that. All right? that's, what, that's what he's saying. But if they are seeking to get you to follow them, then that's not seeking you commendably. Right. Uh, the opening phrase of verse 18 could be translated, it says, it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. manner. Literally, it could be translated, it is good to be zealous for the good. <laughs> I thought that's kind of interesting. This re refers to the focus of the zeal, for self or for God. What are you interested in? Uh, and it refers to the kind of zeal that ought to be produced in the disciples as well. Well, we're rushing through all of this. But the main point is, all right, so we have this section. Paul says, I want you to be like me. Then he says, Don't, you were like me in the past. But now, he says, you're not like me, and we're having this trouble. All right? And that's really sums up where we're at. And then he comes to this very, very, he's almost restating what he says in the proposition in verse 12, but he's, he's expressing it in very personal and powerful terms, verse 19 and 20, the agony of maintaining 
gospel union. He says, my little children, or excuse me, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. And so he uses a very striking and forceful metaphor here. The metaphor is of a woman in childbirth. And the key word is again. Uh, Timothy George quotes of somebody named uh, Gaventa on these terms. He says this term, Odenane, never refers to the mere fact of a birth, but always to the accompanying anguish. Now, I assume he knows what he's talking about, but the idea here, we translate it labor. Paul feels like he is in hard labor. He is he is like a, a mother giving birth to a child, and it's a very, very difficult experience. He says, I am really burdened for you. Uh, and he's going through this pain and anguish and danger of childbirth all over again. For these, his own spiritual children. It's, it is so perplexing and difficult and hard for him, is what he's saying. I wish that you could be like me because I became like you, he says. I would like you to be united in Christ. We had that. No, we don't have that. Oh, my children, if you would realize the labor I'm going through for you. And he says, it's very funny how he does this. My children, with whom I am again in labor, until, until what? Until Christ is formed in you. And he uses a, he's switching the metaphor around. It's almost like the believers are the ones who are now in the metaphor pregnant. And they are carrying Christ. And he wants them to carry Christ to term, if you will, and that Christ would be fully developed within them. And it's kind of funny how Paul does this. He, his metaphors, he just slides from one right to the other. But anyway, here he is. His earnest desire, his great labors are so that they will reproduce in their own lives true Christ likeness, so that they will be so that they will go through the labor the intense labor of forming godliness in their life. And then he says in verse 20, But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. He's in agony. He's in anguish. He says, I wish I could be there. Now, we think the Galatians was written just as Paul was setting out for Rome and the Jerusalem Council to settle some of these very pressing questions, the very same questions that Galatians is dealing with. All right, and Galatians is, and so, and he says, I, I can't come to see you right now, but I wish I could. One of the reasons is because as you're writing a letter, there's a certain level at which the, just the, it's impersonal, and you don't, you're not able to con convey the warmth of personal commitment to one another. I'm sure if Paul was in their presence, he would still be stern about their errors, but he would do it in a way that they could really tell that he did indeed love them. And he wasn't just writing them a tough letter because he could. All right? And so uh, Paul really desires their spiritual recovery and renewed growth. He's laboring that they would be united with Christ. That's what he calls them to. He says, we once had it, and now we don't have it because of these false teachers, and they're not really interested in you. They're interested in themselves. That sums up our passage in just a few words. I'd like to come back to one or two ideas in this passage, as I mentioned, but I wanted you to get that overall picture first. And as we close, I have a fairly lengthy quote from Grant Osborne's commentary that I'd like to share with you. It is, uh, it's kind of long, but it does sum things up, and it comes to a real good applicational point in the second paragraph. So bear with me as I read this to you. And we'll probably make comments as we go. Paul's purpose in this section has been to awaken the Galatians from their spiritual doldrums and make them aware of the serious error into which they have fallen. He rehearsed the wonderful results of his first missionary journey when they had warmed up to him so fully and so readily accepted his gospel and the Christ he proclaimed. Those had been fantastic times and the friendship they had developed with Paul had been deeply satisfying to him. This backdrop to the current situation made Paul doubly chagrined as he witnessed from afar the results of the Judaizers' foray into the Galatian churches. It was as though he had never truly known these believers. This heresy in which they had become embroiled had caused them to turn away, both from God 
and his truth and from Paul as Christ's emissary. How could they have given up all they had received from God and been so easily deceived? So that's the summary section. That's, that really summarizes everything we've just said in this passage. Now, here's the application section. This is the same question we often ask today as we see people whom we thought had a close walk with Christ, abandoning the faith with all its benefits, then turning back to the world's shallow and meaningless lifestyle. Have you not seen people do this? You see people who will step back and they seem to turn away and they seem to just be involved in other ideas and they they sometimes will almost parade them in front of you and it is so astonishing and heartbreaking. Paul's plea to the Galatians to wake up to the apostasy that was about to ruin them for eternity should be our response to similar tragedies in ministry. We do not fight the same Judaizing heresy, so it's not exactly the same. But we do combat temptations and teachings that are just as pernicious. pernicious. The pressures of the world and the insidious attraction of works righteousness for believers. Many who have been serious followers of Christ have abandoned the faith, often trying to live for the attractions of the world and still be right with God on the basis of the goodness they perceive in themselves. Paul's arguments in this section for turning back to Christ and the love he showed for these sadly deluded brothers and sisters are both models we need to embrace in ministry to the fallen among our churches. Perhaps you know somebody like this. I don't know how you turn them back. It seems like they are as hard as stone But we do need to love them and we need to call them back to the truth. Sometimes stern language is involved. Sometimes we need to call out their error. That's true. But we also need to show them that it is a matter of real deep personal love. That there is a a way out. It's not that you are writing them off and it's not that you are pushing them away. It's that you are saying, look, you need to repent. Don't you remember what it was like Don't you remember the fellowship we used to have? Don't you remember those good times in the Lord that we once had? And uh, call them back. Call them back. That's what Paul is doing here in this section of Galatians. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we consider and reflect on this passage as we've rushed through it this evening. Our Father, we thank you for the word of God. Lord, I pray that our people would be firmly committed to a faithful walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that it's not by our might or our strength that this can be done, but only through your Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in our midst and you would encourage each one to follow you faithfully. We pray for our people and help them to love you and to serve you. Lord, we pray for our own walk, each one of us individually, that we would be committed and not fall away. Keep us in your love in in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. We'll talk to you again soon.